here for a performance of uh, Louis Giuliano, featured two pianos and a ticket are available, sponsored for two or three of your students. And I'll be making an announcement about that. And if you have any more today, I'll just All right, without further ado, welcome.
questions and you don't have to feel bad if you don't know the answers. Most people don't know. Uh, so we start with and then we go a bit more deep in that. Uh, which group of instruments does the piano belong to? Right. So it's basically a, 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 a percussion instrument actually. Uh, and uh, when we play the tone, we have no control over what happens. So we, we push the key, you probably know that, and at some point the, the hammer is leaving the, the, the key, and when it, it, uh, it, uh, it hits the string, it hits the string in a free fall, uh, in minus G, up, upwards, and actually we have no more control over what happens. And still, if it was a percussion instrument, uh, that would be very pity because this is actually really an instrument that can sing. I think this is the, one of the things we all learn is, is how to make the piano sing. And uh, we do it mostly on the subconscious level. Uh, we don't really know mostly what we do. And that will be my first question. How do you actually make the piano sing? What do you do? You sit hours and hours on the piano and you make it sing. What do you do? Yes? I think you yourself have to know how to sing first. Okay. So that you, you can kind of create the sound that you like. Mm -hmm. Good. But I, I'm going, it, this, is, this is very good answer and that's mostly the kind of answers uh, that we get. But I want you to, to get a, a, a different perspective on this. Because the answer you gave me is what happens here. And actually here, you don't produce the sound, you produce the sound there. So what actually happens? What do we do on a physical level to make the piano sing? Yes. So we, we strike the keys at a gradually faster or slower rate okay. to produce the melodic line at our, at our desired contour or level. Yes, very good. So we create, uh, uh, we, we make a line by producing relations between the notes. Yeah. And how is it that actually we don't perceive it? Because eventually every tone that we play, that's a very good answer, mm -hmm. every tone that we play is doing actually the minimum though. We play it, it, it goes up and then it goes down again. There is nothing we can do to make it crescendo and still actually we can all hear it. So what actually do we do to make this work? Right. So, I'm, we are originally from Israel, and I have a question for you. Um, so this is a double star. Can you see it, or should I use the black one? Let's try the one. Okay. So yeah, this is better. so. This is a double star, right? So I'm, I'm a very terrible painter. So my question is, how many triangles are there? Unfinished line. A triangle has to have a complete line. And that's, that's basically what happens in the piano. We, our brain is built to create um, uh, logic in what we see. We learn it from a very different uh, young age. At first we see a chair, we, 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 we see the shape, and at some point we know, okay, this is a chair. We don't really think about it anymore. And this is about the same. You saw something that does not exist, and that's what ha actually happens in piano. So unlike violin, and unlike clarinet, and unlike any other instrument that uh, we play, we hear in the piano what we don't do. Everything you do in your life, all the, the, uh, the playing, what you think you hear, does not happen. If you try to play what you really think you are hearing, it will sound awful. Because this is all, it's unlike violin, unlike clarinet, unlike all the melodic instruments that actually produce the sound, we make an illusion of something that does not happen. And we trick the brain 
<laughs> All our piano playing is actually about treating the brain. Nothing that you think that happens is actually happening. I'll give you some examples. Uh, the one thing is that our brain perceives um, things differently when they happen on the beat or off the beat. So everything we hear on the beat, we hear it stronger and clearer. And everything that we hear off the beat, here, uh, we hear it uh, as, as a kind, a, a part of a line. So if I will go and I will play, um, uh, yeah, we hear it very, very accent. It doesn't sound very continuous. But if I will go and I will go like this, and I basically, well, I didn't do it as strong. Let's say again on the beat, not so strong. It still doesn't sound very melodic, but if I go in like this, that actually sounds much more melodic. What, what I actually did is I shifted the accent from the beat to the next note. That's all. But because it didn't happen on the beat, we don't hear we hear so we hear a line. Technically, there were accents before the first note, now I moved all the accents to the second note, and suddenly it sounds like a line. So it's actually a trick. It's not, it's not real, and you do it all the time. Now, why no one tells you this? Because no one needs to. Because when you're playing solo, you practice, you do uh, error and try, you play, and everyone tells you and told us, oh, you're playing so beautiful, it sounds so, so, so good. And you don't, you do it on the subconscious level. You don't really need to know it. And unfortunately, when you come to play four hands, you have uh, yeah, a problem because all those things that happen in the subconscious level, now you have to design the sound by yourself. So how do we create a line? Let's, let's go over it. The first thing, of course, is to make a, a contour. So if we, we go, you know, uh, people give me a lot of time uh, to answer, like, we do legato. Yeah, but actually you could make a line in crotato. You don't really need to do it in the gut. And now what I did, I went strong, more. I made actually something like this. So you, you can control it. And it has to happen on the, off the beat. If you go on the beat, then, then it will sound um, much more aggressive. The other thing that we can do is, again, playing with this what the brain can hear or not, and that's taking time. So there is big rubato, but we can also take timing to make things sound more continuous. And the, the rule, as a rule, is that if we take time before a, a tone, usually our brain will not focus on the beginning of the sound, it will jump to what's going afterwards. So if I go and I go... Uh, that sounds a bit aggressive, the last one. But if I'll do the same and I will play a bit later, suddenly we move and our brain didn't hear the beginning when it wanted to hear. It didn't focus on the beginning of sound. It moved to the, what happens afterward. And then suddenly it sounds like you have a longer sound. But it's not true. They're both going down in the same speed. It's just, it's one big illusion. And I'm, of course, part of this illusion. I know what I'm doing. I know it's like this. And still, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm part of the illusion. And luckily, uh, the piano, it's a, you know, it's a wonderful, a wonderful machine. Uh, we have uh, the ability to create harmonies. And what we can do with harmonies, again, uh, shaping the overtones, and we can change the balance. If you look at what, what uh, pianists do, on the, mostly on a sub subconscious level, they constantly change the balance between the voices. By the way, do you know how many voices we can hear in the same time? There is now a new research that proves absolutely how many voices can a person hear in the same time. Okay, sorry? Is it one? One. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can only hear one voice at the same time. What we can do is, is jump very fast between the voices. And, and that's why you see, by the way, many composers, they don't, if you look at Brahms, the way it works, he doesn't even write any more complete uh, lines. He, he basically fill in, and many times people say, oh, you want to play more, more uh, 
polyphonic, you have to take off the line, but it's actually not quite true. You can play every place, the first line is not there. And, and amazingly, the piano can, our brain can actually fill in what he doesn't hear, because we can hear backward and forward. So if I, I uh, go, uh, you know, uh, I, I will still hear the line that does not exist. I don't really have to play. I don't really have to play both lines. Um, now, on the harmonic level, what we can do is, um, is change the relation between the voices. And, and the, the rule is basically that the more balance we do to the upper voice, the more... Uh, the less timing we need to create a cantabile. The more voices we do, the more dark we go in color, the more time we need. And when we change balance, if we go, for example, uh, from tonica to dominata, so if I go... and it sounds more continuous, what I did basically, I went up in crescendo, and, and parallel I went diminuendo, so when you change the balance between the voices, when you go to, so you go to and you open, it will sound more continued. If I go both in the same direction, then it sounds going away faster. The more balance you do, the more time you use. So th these are basically our two instruments. We uh, two, two basic instruments. We can take time and we can make the balance. And what is always good and that's what we'll probably do also in the master class a bit, is to divide um, the voices. So each voice will have place between the other, the other instruments. So otherwise it gets very thick. And that's it's a big problem with piano do because when we started Sivan and I, we we're both playing already quite a few years alone, of course, and you know, doing competitions and doing all the things that everyone do. And then uh, we started playing together, and it didn't sound as beautiful as it sounded in solo. So we had to take all those things that we were doing on a subconscious level and turn them into conscious in order to actually be able to do it. Uh, for example, in, in, in Mendelssohn, uh, if I will play the same emphasis as Sivan, it will sound very aggressive. So all my... All my, my my balance you know, it even doesn't sound right when you play it alone because it's all built to create the right overtones and the right uh, kind of um, shape in the in the main voice, and that's that's uh, that's something we can all be I think more aware of because we we're used to to do those things in a in the subconscious level. We are not used actually to, to really think what, what actually happens. We, we are very focused about this area. That's where, but th this area is actually nothing happens. It's, everything happens there. And then of course there is what pe people call touch, uh, which is to a certain extent possible to influence. Uh, the piano mechanic is, is very strong actually. It makes a lot of noise. It, you can make up to 30% of the sound in the beginning as a mechanic. Uh, so if you play softer, it will sound uh, softer, but eventually, you know, if you come to play with Long Beach Symphony and you have uh, 2,000 people, all right? Mm -hmm. It's not really... That's, that has the least effect. So if you put a microphone in a recording hall, definitely. If you are in a small hall, yes. But, but when you come to a big hall, that's really not the, that's not the point. We just played before we came here. We played in one of the scariest halls. It's the Festival House in Salzburg. It's too wide. And you have to play like crazy. It's everything. You give everything you have. And by the end of the concert, you really had a workout. It's really something that you're completely, with big orchestra, it's com you completely have to give everything there is. There is no time, actually, for so when we talk about touch, actually, we usually talk more about timing. Because if you go and you do like this, it will give you um, also timing. So that's why people do it. It's not so much about the touch, although it does, it does have an effect. So th these are the three elements. And you can see each pianist have their own uh, solutions. 
Um, for example, uh, I think one of the most extreme solutions is Mount Algerich. Uh, basically, Mount Algerich is amazing in changing the balance. She changed constantly the balance between the voices, but she doesn't take time. She likes to go forward and she still returns the, the colors just by changing the balance. While you can take timing and, and get your color. So it depends, uh, it's always a, a play of how you want to do it and uh, what are the balances to, to, to make it. So that's the, the first thing I want to tell you about pian playing piano do and actually what, what we do also as pianists. And I always recommend you to play piano for hands and to think about it because everything you think you know in solo will not work in piano do. All your balance, everything you're feeling on the piano, what you worked for years, once you divide the chord between two of you, you are in the very, very present danger of sounding like a not so wonderful, talented <laughs> pianist anymore. Yeah, that's, and that's why you can get two wonderful pianists, they sit together, it sounds awful. Yeah, because the balance doesn't fit anymore. The timing doesn't fit. The, 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 all this, this voicing that we do by ourselves. And, and the worst thing you can do, uh, which a lot of people do, they try to, to decide what are the directions and to create all the voices going in the same direction, which is only untalented pianists actually do constantly. We, no, I'm sure none of you do it. To everyone, to their own level. Yeah, it's, it's just something we cannot... It doesn't even feel right, yeah. So that's why it's so great also for students to, to play piano do, because uh, you will learn all the things that you don't, you fly, you know you fly, but you don't know how to fly. You just do it. And this will teach you how to actually, what, what is that you're looking, what kind of balance, what kind of colors you look. It teaches so much to, to do it, so I always think that's a wonderful thing to do. And uh, that was my first uh, two cents of wisdom. <laughs> now, if there is any, uh, you want to ask me any question or something that are you interested? Yes. So when, when she, different pianists, let's say like, for example, so I heard someone mention Glenn Gould. Like, Glenn Gould had a very particular way of like, playing with his guitar, like mm -hmm. goes down, like goes right. down. Like, yes. What, like, what is the purpose of an approach like that? Um, Mm -hmm. Do you think, like in your opinion, not necessarily it is, but like where different pianists maybe have their own approach to articulation and touch, mm -hmm. if, if we can't really control the way that the yes. hand strikes um, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So someone asked me uh, last year, he asked me, do you think you should play Bach with pedal? Yeah, but it's basically a bit... And, and I told him, well, you know, if you look at the... Anyway, this is not the right instrument to play Bach. Um, if you look at the Bach fugue, well, that's what you, you're relating to. Um, if you, you have... A, Bach, a fugue is basically a, a, a polyphonic improvisation on a choral. It's the choral that actually creates a structure, and then you have different voices that are creating uh, uh, improvisation on the, on the... If you can have all the voicing, and you can have the harmony, and you have the colors, and you have the structure, I don't care if you have pedal or not. <coughs> I think it's very difficult to do with pedal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think it's very, very difficult to do this uh, if you have pedal, because you have less possibilities. Um, although also pedal, um, like uh, other things, it's also um, a question of psychology, not so much uh, an on-off thing. Right. Uh, for example, um, uh, we just did Mozart concerto, and my first passage I go like this. <laughs> now, how much pedal did I use? Yeah. Sorry? Yes. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. So basically what I did, I, I cheat. I go like this, and you can do it try again. So I play this all the beginning with one. But you don't hear it. 
And, and the, the interesting thing, if I let it off on the beat, you will hear it. If I go, then you will hear it. But if, if I go, and then I play no pedal at all, you will not hear it. So it's, it's a question of average. And also, like everything else we do, by the way, a pedal is something that you perceive differently on the beat and off the beat. So if I go the same, you know, like this, it will sound a lot of pedal, but if I go, it suddenly doesn't. And all I did was to, to get rid of the first one. So I played. If we are, we are clean on the beats, we can get away with a, a huge amount of pedal that happens off the beat. Our, our brain are just routed to hear on the beat. And everything else we hear differently. So you can get along with a lot. Also in Schubert now, what we did is, is much more pedal than you think. Also on the passages, yeah, so... Uh, so I actually, I used a lot of pedal, but all my, all my, my points that I were clear, they were all clean. So pedal can be much more than... So that, that's, I hope, uh, that's... I mean, again, we took it to the other... Yeah. Okay, so it's a question of, of clarity, but it's, you cannot answer it. Um, it's, it's also a question on what, what shape he does. So different shape would require different, uh, different um, touch or different range of articulation. Um, it's really a, it's a, it's a balance that you have to find for it. I think basically Glenn Gould, um, Glenn Gould was very interested in certain elements. Right. And in, it's, it's a bit of an extreme case because uh, in those elements that he was interested, he reached a level that was almost unparalleled. But he was willing to sacrifice a lot for that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I find the sacrifices he does already unjustified. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a bit... He, he's, he's walking a very thin line between... So it's a great way to learn, you know, about certain aspects of piano playing. Uh, at some point, sometimes, it's already too much. I, I also think, you know, it's today we live in a world where, um, um, you know, the, the performer is sort of the, the center, but we, we have to remember that eventually we, we don't really do much. Uh, we we play Schubert and Schubert is Schubert whether you play it or not. He doesn't he doesn't really need you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we I, I I you know I play because I, I love playing and I enjoy what I'm doing and I have great life. Uh, you know, a bit extreme for a lot of people, but I, I enjoy it. But I, I don't think I'm that uh, important. I, I don't think what we do is is that important in a way. It's, it's already there. Uh, so, you know, in, in German, we are not considered artists. We are only, uh, they call it Nachschaffender Kunstler. So they're, they're people who create after the Kunst is, is after the art is already there. So, and, and you look at Bach, he also didn't see himself as, you know, he was serving uh, God and, and he was basically writing, uh, you know, for practical purposes. So I, I think we should all look at this much more, uh, you know, in shape. Of course, music is extremely important. I think right. it's, it's one of the most important. But I don't think that, you know, you or me or any pian other pianist mm -hmm. uh, with S name or that, is that really that, that important as we would like to think. Yeah. <laughs> we just give, you know, Mozart is Mozart and Schubert is Schubert. And, and that's, that's basically it. Okay. Yeah. Any more? about piano playing. Uh, and I, I, this is something I want you to all to experiment with. So I, I would really urge you to go home, look at your pieces, and try to see how you can, um, how you can, uh, you know, div divide a voice, control your contour, and, and look how you can change voicing and create colors by, by the different elements that we have. And always remember that what you think, and, and you see it a lot of, of pianists, they have difficulties because they try to play what is written in a way. 
and it's, it's not a clarinet. In a clarinet, you can actually do it, but not in a piano. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about Schubert because that was the second thing we wanted to talk about. Um, so uh, you probably know, um, oh, and, and by the way, this, this thing of, of separating voices, um, composers are actually quite obsessed with it um, since the classical time. The moment uh, they, they stopped writing, they started writing perioda, which is a, a symmetrical phrase, you know, two and two. Uh, then at that moment, they uh, they were um, they were they had a problem that everything will be uh, too much on on the beat on the symmetrical, and they started writing things to make it off the beat. It's not something that I invented. They were really dealing with it. Mozart, by the way, has a really beautiful letter to his father, and he writes, um, I played today a great concert. He always played a great concert when he was writing to his father. Mm -hmm. And the audience noted that, uh, noticed that my left hand and my right hand were completely separated. So that's Mozart, right? So what, what Mozart does, he, uh, he, st uh, he, starts, he starts with the, the Galan style, which is, you know what's Galan style? Yeah? The, the Galan style is the style that people developed after the first Weimar school uh, to avoid everything beyond the beat. So they create kinds of words to postpone the beat, to, to make it later. So if, if you look at history of music, the most, maybe the most important composer was Stamitz. Yeah, Stamitz, you know Stamitz? How many people of Stamitz you know? Not so many. Stamitz was the most important composer. He, he basically developed the clarinet, so we have the clarinet because of Stamitz, and he created the symphony orchestra because he incorporated the clarinet into the orchestra, and he also worked on the sonata form with, with um, other composers also. Haydn developed it. Well. So he's, he's one of the most influential composers uh, in the history of music. But if you look at his music, it sounds like... Uh, Now, this is not a piece by Stamitz, it's a piece by Mozart. And Mozart takes this and turn it into a Galant style. And Galant style means you postpone it to the, to, the, to the next beat, so you are not on the one, so you write. <laughs> That's the next, next level. And that wasn't enough for Mozart. So from middle uh, time, Mozart is writing um, that the melody always goes to the second bar, and the, the bass goes away from the second bar. So if you look to piano concerto, sorry, I just, we just played. So the third movement is go one, two, three, four. Yeah? So you start with the orchestra, you have violins, go pa 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 da, da, da. They'll never go pa 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 da, and go away. So it's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, one, two. And the orchestra and the bass goes. from the middle period. So if you go with always to the second. Yeah? And the bass always goes away. And you know uh, everything goes to the second bar. Basically. All the concerto. The concerto all goes to the second bar besides the last one. The last one is on the first bar because it's not a perioda. It's a, it's a baroque phrase with Three and a half bars, two and a half bars, and, and two bars. So it's it's not symmetrical, so we don't need to be off the beat. The older composers are completely obsessed about voice separation and 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 going away from the beat. It's it's something that happens all the all the um, all the period besides all the, the classical besides Beethoven. Beethoven has completely completely different way of writing, which we'll we'll talk immediately. 
and that's why uh, Beethoven is, uh, is it's a it's a one it's a almost one time thing. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about Schubert. Um, so we we played for you a piece uh, from the middle period by Schubert, uh, and uh, if you look at classical music, the history of classical music. Uh, most of the important works that were written are sonatas. Now, when you come to think about it, this is absolutely illogical. Because you have Mozart, great composer, Schubert, great composer, and Brahms, also great composer, and Mozart, very good composer, and so on and so forth. And everyone has to write by a, a, a sort of a tablet or a program that was made by, by developed uh, by Axel Haydn, and everyone used the same system to write all the important works. Everyone changed it. No one actually used the sonata as it is, but everyone feels that this is a very good program, and no one actually almost ever thinks about the new one. And th that's ridiculous when you think about it, because if you're a great composer, you should be able to make your own structure. To use a template that was written in the 18th century and use all your important works until deep into the 20th century. That that's doesn't sound that logical, what do you think? Yeah. So actually, what is about Sonata that is so great? Why does all those composers think that this is, this is great, we can write sonatas? What's about the Sonata? What's the point? Why is it any good? Why do you need to write hundreds of pieces all in the same form? I, I think it's really crazy when you think about it. Yes? Surely the sonata provides a great structure for storytelling. Like, okay. Uh, because like, um, even if it's like a taka, there's usually, like if it's a one movement, and there's, there's like parts to it, like there's a beginning and some sort of like a middle and then an end. So mm -hmm. I feel like it's... Yeah, but there are other... Yeah. Not as, as good as sonata. So what's what's about the sonata? What's you're right. It's it's a, it's a good piece by storytelling. And when you see, by the way, the pieces that are not sonatas that are made, you know, like the Chopin ballad, mm -hmm. it's great pieces with a completely new structure. Yeah, it's it's a one time piece. It's in a way, it's Chopin that did this, or Schubert fantasy, which creates a completely new structure. Um, so what's about the sonata, which is so good, and what's the problem with it? Yes? Um, I read a criticism recently from one of my classes mm -hmm. on like, how sonatas were super popular during this time, and how he was sort of criticized for trying to like, adjust the sonata form. Okay. People liked it so much because of this like, tension and variation. Okay, right. And how does it feel? How is it? Yeah, but, but a, 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 a exposition development and recap, that, that's also something you can find in any yeah. ABA form. Yeah. So I, I think that the important thing about the sonata is not the first theme and not the second theme, is actually the story. It's what happens in between. So the sonata is, is, a, is, a, is a journey in, to, in, uh, in a tension between different elements. That's what makes the sonata so powerful. And although you can build a, a structure which is free, like Chopin Ballads, it is apparently very difficult. <coughs> uh, apparently, it's very difficult to create such pieces. Many composers wrote uh, free pieces. Liszt, by the way, tried quite a few, and it didn't work as well as the sonata, which is actually a combination between the sonata, the principle of sonata, which is not about People tell you in school, oh, we have first, second team, and uh, first team, and second team. No, it's not about this. It's about the journey, what happens in between. Because putting themes next to each other, that has been actually done much before. But the sonata gives us the possibility to create the drama. And that's what's about, that's why it became so effective, and why the composer thought this is a very balanced um, possibility. And the, the composer who did this best uh, was Beethoven. And what Beethoven does is very different than all other composers in a way. 
uh, what he does, he, he was terrible in writing melodies, actually. He, he, he didn't really have any good melodies. It wasn't interesting for him. He knew how to take very small elements. It could be melodic, it could be rhythmical, it could be anything else. Ta 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 ta, more. Actually, no, tam pam, pa da da. Yeah? And that's enough. Now you can build the structure. So it's all about how you develop the structure. And every mo mo a note that he does actually relates to this sonata, his, his death sonata writer, about how to create actually this journey, how to create a drama, how to create this, this um, tension between the different elements and how to develop them. And he did it um, unlike any other composer, and maybe besides Stravinsky, who also used the same way of taking elements and, and surprising us, making the drama. But he couldn't write melodies. When he once wrote a melody, you know, like second movement of Opus 90, he's so happy with himself, he just repeated hundreds of times, but Schubert writes every second in London Tuesday better melodies. So it's not our similar melody. It's very good. But, but, and it's not, not that he was a bad composer, he's an amazing composer, just that was not his thing. And in a way, he destroyed all the composers after him, because everyone was so impressed by Beethoven that everyone wanted to write like Beethoven, and everyone failed. Because, on definition, everyone were people who write melodies. And when you have a melody, the problem with writing melody structurally is that you have an inside logic of the melody. And once you have an inside logic of the melody, it's very hard to develop it as fast. It takes time. You finish what you wanted to say, and now you can start going on to the next thing. Beethoven doesn't need it. He just writes a little thing, and it's all about, let's go up and develop it really, really quickly. And that's amazing structurally, but it is a problem. And uh, I mean, from, from all the other composers, everyone else wants to write like Beethoven, and all of them fail. And Schubert's life is dominated, dominated by this, uh, this uh, struggle. And he's, uh, he's having really difficult times. I mean, this is, uh, it doesn't really work for him as, uh, as he wanted. He has a lot, a lot of unfinished pieces. Because or not, in his heart, he's a, a, the biggest melodist, maybe, you know, in history. The, the one who wrote the best hits, and they're all wonderful, you know. Um, and he, uh, in his struggle, is also not very successful, so probably that makes his life even more complicated, because he has time to struggle anyway. No one ever plays his pieces, you know. No one knows his symphonies was ever performed in his lifetime. Uh, his last piano sonata was published in 1904. Um, and then, towards the end of, li of his life, he finds a new structure. Um, he finds a new structure that Beethoven didn't have, that he, he was actually sort of relating all the time, all his life, but towards the end of life, it's, it's crystallized, and then he <coughs> finds a new structure that um, no one ever did before, and funny enough, almost no one ever did after, because no one knew who Schubert is. They, they knew, I mean, Schubert, Schumann has a letter, he writes, oh, there is one composer, he's Schumann, uh, Schubert, he's a very, very good composer, he also wrote some very four, uh, nice forehand pieces, but most of the composers didn't, Schubert was almost unknown, most of his work was, no one knew it, no one played it, it was just not there. So his new uh, idea about structure got lost, and the only composer who, who finds Schubert and also performs him, and also use Schubert, his Schubert structure to, to, in a way to create music is Mahler. So Mahler is the only, the first composer actually used the Schubert type. Now what Schubert likes to do, and we will see it now in, also in Levin Schubert, he tried to create a new structure, not by tension of motivic development, which is what everyone tries to do after Beethoven, but on harmonic, on tonalic tension. And if you look uh, at fantasy, you all know fantasy, right? Or by Schubert. Um, if you look them, uh, it from, from Beethoven's perspective, there is no structure. Because he starts in the theme, and then there is a second theme, then he comes back to the first theme, and then the second theme, and then for again the first theme, then come the uh, come, uh, uh, ending of the, of the second theme, so it repeats like seven times, and then there is a, a Adagio, which is uh, 
also one A, B, A, and then again a, 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 a another uh, Allegro, which is also a lot of themes coming up one after the other, each one more difficult than the other one, but actually no structure. And then eventually you finish with the fugue, which is not even a fugue because there are no modulations, it's all the same. He just goes on the dominant and stays there for half an hour, and then he, he, he finished with the theme once more, once more. <laughs> so if you look at it like this, it, it's a piece that has no structure, but it, it has a wonderful structure. And the structure is only the relation between uh, tonalities. So we start on the, so we start in the minor, and then we go after a full page into major. So this, this is a, 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 a motive in a way. Yeah, we have this, and we have major. Then we come back to minor, and then we have the, we go this, and again major. So all, all the, and then he goes and it, it becomes more and more faster and faster and, and we won't get to this today because I think we are running out of time, right? Yes, uh, absolutely, yes. So, um, but all the structure is actually only built on, on tonalities. And in a way, that's why um, his last sonatas are so long. If you ever played uh, any of his sonatas, you should try to find the second structure. The second structure is the tonalities. And that's why he needs so long. And that's why also Mahler's symphonies are so long. Because you have double structure. You have the sonata structure, and you have a second parallel structure, which is the relation between the harmonies. Once you see it, you realize that it's very short. If you look at the last movement of the last uh, sonata, he actually repeats the theme only twice. It sounds a lot, but it's not. It's only two times. What he does, he goes every time to different tonalities within the theme. And there are only two repeats, the whole thing. So um, that's, that's uh, the new structure. And the funny thing about it, that it is something that no one knew. And people would, you know, it's always strange to play this game. What if, you know, what could happen? If, if the Schumann would use, for example, his, in his pieces, the Schubert template, and try to write music which has uh, harmonic structure. Because Schumann actually never solved this problem. He, he had this amazing early pieces, which he writes the most beautiful things he wants, you know, Castellana and the Homo Esca and, all, and so on, but has actually no real structure. And then later he starts writing sonata form, and once he starts writing sonata form, it does diminish his ability to be free on his melody. So the last pieces are never as touching as the early pieces, but they have better structure. If you use the Schubert structure, maybe he could have got around it and still keep his melodies and get the structure, but he never knew Schubert really that well, so he never got to do it. Uh, so this is, this is something that is, um, you know, it's a one-time thing in history of music. We always take our history of music as something for granted. This is, this is what we have, and all great music, but it is not perfect, and it's, it's beautiful that it's not perfect. Those composers, they, they struggle, they use these pamphlets that structurally, they wrote amazing ideas, they had fantastic material, touching material that we all moved, but they also were struggling and trying different things to see how that worked. And once you, you think like this, I think it, it makes your life very interesting. I always try to, to, try to step into what the composer was interested in. And of course, what we are dealing with is, is not what the composer is doing. We are dealing with, with color, with, with ballads, with, with, uh, and these things, not only they were not interest, uh, always uh, very dealing with, they didn't even have to, because if you look at Schubert, uh, his piano was very different than ours. So all these things that I just talked about, ballads, whatever, that was not that important in his piano. You know, Beethoven writes on, on the first chord in pathetic. Uh, you should play the chord. You know what? You know the, what he writes? It's it's crazy. He writes, you play the chord and you wait until it's gone. Yeah, in this piano, it will take about a minute, but in his piano, it takes about three seconds. So, and that's the relation: twenty times more sound. So you need twenty times more balance. And we play, you know, you play today uh, in big halls. You know, so it's a completely different way of playing. 
doesn't really matter. I don't think it would have mattered for them either because the, the main thing is we all serve the music and we all try to make it, to, to give it to other people. So that, that's, you know, it's, it's fine. But we have to s have different solutions for the same problem, which is also what you said about the group. It, it doesn't really matter what the solution is as long as it's, it's complete and it makes sense. So thank you, and now let's hear a bit Schubert. <coughs> yes.
very, very interesting. And uh, it was supposed to be a first movement of the sonata, a wonderful type pieces. And what is remarkable, we, we can also see here how he, he also tries to do this parallel uh, structure with, with harmonies. You have the first theme in A major, and we have the second theme starting in, in A flat major. So it's the A minor to F flat major. It's like the, the furthest away you can think of. Um, it's, it's quite, uh, and, and then a whole thing is actually in, in four voices. You could almost rewrite this as a quintet. So it has, um, okay, so uh, we will talk a little bit uh, also about things that relate to what we did before. Um, we did very, some very beautiful things. Um, when we have a, a, a theme, which is a pa pa pam pa pa pam pa pa pam yeah? Uh, can I? Um, if we do, if we want to create a line, yes? And we have this... Uh, same way, we get it a bit hacked, so it becomes a bit chopped. I think you know this, right? So it's very practical not to do all of them the same. Not to do which is a bit what you try to do. <laughs> and it, it does, I think you know, you notice it doesn't work. So there are different ways how to, right? Good. So we are. In this. If, if something I say and you think, oh, I actually prefer my way, <laughs> I'm very good in this. The, I, I'm very good with it because I think I'm 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 here to help you achieve what you want. So this is all musical. Uh, but if something uh, you want something else, that's also good. Um, so go to the one, and then I actually would not go to the. Two. So maybe. There are different mo there are different structure you could do, but mm -hmm. let's try now this one on, yes, and then not on the one, ta -ta -tum, ta -ta -tum, and then again on the one. So ta ta tam, pa pa pam, pa pa pam, pa pa pam. Okay, that's one. And the second thing is that if we do all the voices in the same direction, which is a bit what we did, and you got better by the way during the piece, which was very nice to see. Uh, bravo! Yes. Uh, then it sounds very heavy. So if I go, oh, that's so when I do it, I actually cheat. Yeah, I I play I play. I don't play. Why? Because we said if we have a long note and we want it to sound more continuous, we have to change the balance, which means this one goes, but not this. No. That's it. It's, it's finished. But if you go and then you don't go not on the one, but then suddenly it has much more. And suddenly you have a line. Yeah? Okay, so that's not easy. And I can tell you even more. You can actually when I, I'm obsessed with octaves, I think octave is, is one of the most beautiful thing there is, and lots of people neglect their octaves. And um, when I see two voices like you know like this, I never do all of them in the same direction. I never play actually parallel voices octaves the same. So if I have this, uh, uh, I never go. Exactly. So the two hands are different. So you can also experiment with this. Not the this a bit more to the one, and this goes a bit away. Chan goes to the one, mm -hmm. we never actually go to the one in the bass. The bass is never on the one. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. In this register, in this piano, still sound enough. Okay. Don't, don't worry about it. Okay. Yes? Okay. Good. Okay, let's try. Let's try. And let's, let's try not to stop before. Let's go. 
you want to achieve, you want to, to stop because you felt it's too aggressive. Mm. But like I said, we don't need necessarily to take time. And it's not very good to take time in, in the middle of a, 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 a rhythmic uh, element. Yeah? It's much better to change the balance. I know. <laughs> really what's so interesting about piano it's it's very messy actually mm. because everything you learn in your solo it's not true Seven, eight, nine. You have nine notes in the first chord, and your melody, which is based, 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 made from both octa, uh, both eights, because one is it's too thin, should support seven other notes in balance. And ideally, you would have to have for each one of those sort of a play. Each one has to come, and you should know. Okay, this is the balance with the dits. What Sivan and I do all the time. Let's let's play only one chord, just a chord together. One chord, yeah. Yeah, just together. You are also here, yeah? And 40. Okay, let's try it together again. Oh, no. 
on a on a on a on a on the base when you have a, a, a dominant tetrapod. Mm. But this is not quite a dominant tetrapod. So this G yeah, he has to go up. Okay, so you see how it is all the time not the same. Mm -hmm. And what I would uh, suggest you all, when you come to deal with forehand text, uh, you can sit down and play always the, the bass and the soprano and try to understand what's the difference between a, a bass, which is uh, a, a line, melodic, and what when it becomes a harmonic text. And a harmonic function w has a completely different set of rules for um, how we do it. Okay, good. Now, um, we had the same problem here, yeah? We have this... Uh, so you went... Yeah, so it's not, it's not a, you, you, terrible, yeah? This is really how we would play it if you had a log, if you had this... so much the harmony that it makes your life quite miserable. Mm. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone else. Uh, let's try, uh, why don't you try to play for me once this one and this one. Yeah, just like this, yeah. No, no, just, just this. Yeah. Just like this. This? Oh, no, okay. and this. Thank you. This is a, it, it's, it's like many pieces, like fantasy, uh, in, in Schubert last pieces, and by the way, in Mozart last pieces and Beethoven last pieces, you, we all see them as the classical composers, but when it comes to the last year, all of them started writing, uh, start writing uh, no Baroque music. They start to use Baroque elements. You know, Mozart writes a many magic flute, starts with a fugue. Last Symphony has a big fugue at, at the very end. Beethoven, of course, all the last pieces become, uh, has all the last sonatas have uh, fugues in it and Grosse Fuga. And also Schubert, fantasy is actually a Baroque form. So they all, uh, each one of them separately comes to his last years and say, oh, we want to do also more Baroque. And ta-da, this is a motif from Baroque. It's a, it's a sign motif, you know? If you have two sad motifs, the one is the sign motif. <laughs> Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and the other one is the tear motif. Yeah, this. <coughs> yeah, that's the, the tear. Okay, so tadam, tadam, hop, tadam. That's a very sad. Now, Lebensstrume is not an original title by Schubert, mm -hmm. uh, but it is very, you know, very touching. Okay, let's try again, and I want you really to have the most beautiful compound as well. Okay, just this. No question. Okay, let's do it again. <laughs> and now I, I, I just, again, play again. Do for me the wonderful cantabile you just did. And without changing, think what actually I'm doing with my left hand. You see, your instincts are completely right. Just we have to learn how to transfer it. I'll show you what you did before. Before you played, you 
many voices. On a one with a long note, you hear the sound fa dying faster. That's exactly what we talked about before. Mm -hmm. If you have less notes on the one, it will sound longer. It will sound more cantabilated. <laughs> cannot do voice separation, you will have to take time. So you can go so you stop and that would be a pity in a piece which is a la breze and you just started and you will have such a long journey before it. Okay, let's try together. Okay? So imagine you were you were uh, a string quartet. Now you're the viola, mm -hmm. and you get -da -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba. This is much more interesting. Now we said that um, everything that happens on the beat is a problem because if we go some mm -hmm. that would be a bit a bit a problem for us. But everything that happens on the beat sounds more continuous. So what I like to do is is to concentrate on this one. Yes, so. So I don't, that would be, maybe you tried it, it was too heavy and then you went away. Mm -hmm. But if you just go this, let's try to play. If I do it off, off the beat, so what I did is basically so everything is pom, 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 like this. You get by the 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 the, the, the off beat, you get this this stum and drunk, uh, this this uh, mm -hmm. feeling that you go forward. And of course, composer wrote this as a technique all the time. Yeah, Schubert writes, you know, uh, Mendelssohn. This is this is not something that I invented. Yeah. Not the original. The, all the composers were doing it all already before. So I think if you can concentrate on this, then you will create continue, you will have tempo, you will have the voicing, and you don't disturb it. So you can only go forward. actually got a one answer. Mm. Do you think it is thumb, pop, bottom, or thumb, pop, bottom? Sometimes it is thumb, pop, bottom. Sometimes it goes to the second bar. I tend today to believe more in the second bar, which means it's not <laughs> Now, we also have a problem that we have two voices here. And as I said, we cannot really hear two voices. So we have to take it. it. It's basically actually that, that when you have a secondary voice that is below, you don't really need to play the complete line in order for us to hear the voice. When you try to do it, actually, sometimes you get exactly the opposite uh, result. So we have this. So you cannot really hear it. And you don't also want to go. That doesn't really sound that well. Um, 
So you have a couple of possibilities. The one possibility is just to say, okay, we don't have two voices that go in the same direction. We have one voice that goes to the second, and the other voice goes away from the second. So they, are co they complement each other. They create a, one a, 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 a line. So you write down. But he writes the snare here. He doesn't write it here. It's a good question. You can go to the second as well. away from the second, also possible. Mm. Yeah? Or you both go into the second, uh, I wouldn't go to the first anyway. Yeah. That's not, uh, I don't think it's, it's a very good solution. I like a result. Um, the other thing is that I don't think you could play this one too much. You see, if we didn't play it, if we have this, <laughs> interested are this and this one mm -hmm. and not this one yeah by the way you know that uh, so the one before that one after if you go <laughs> you hear both voices without it disturbing if you really try to do it which is a bit what happens here you got yeah by the way you know that when you have an accent on the piano you always never play in in a line you almost never play on the accent or just on one note. So if I have a <laughs> that's one note. Sounds ugly. Usually you do two notes. So I did two notes. I can do also the other way around, three notes. I can do two notes after. So that's I can play this or and I can even do an accent without the real note where the accent is written, just one before and one after. So I can do like this, like this, this note. And stone still would be considered an accent in certain way, if it's an accent that is uh, rhymed. But never, actually ever, in when you have something like this, well, it just shows you that, that in piano what is written is not what you do. If you do what is written, it doesn't sound like it. It doesn't work. Okay, okay, let's try again and let's do only this one and try to play between his notes and not on his notes because when he plays, you have no chance actually. Mm -hmm. That's life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in true work, it's very clear. He, he gets everything. And you get only the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> he has to play, and you have to make him sound fantastic with and control each note until it sounds really amazing. Yeah. Okay, let's try this one. Just the two voices. No, not no one. <laughs> That's what we want to have. We, want, we don't want to have oh, we want to have oh, and that means that C is actually more than A. Mm -hmm. Because you create an imaginary line that doesn't exist. So I said, but I don't have anyone else. So, so you come and play. And I played Beethoven third uh, five times the month before. So I said, okay, I'll come and I'll play Beethoven. And, uh, and I played, it was it's nice, it's a very nice song, and, and we had fun. And then people who knows me came up to me and said, Oh, you played so beautiful, you had such a delicate sound. And I feel, sure, I had 38 degrees. I mean, I, everything was loud. So I, I thought I was playing very loud. It just didn't. So 
strength soft piano forte, we have always to think hard in the way. I mean, we, we, we play uh, eventually always in the same. We almost never play in the way. Um, let's do a bit more. And, and this una coda in this piano, by the way, is very, very aggressive. So you can really go into it. It's just a question of, of making the overtone. It doesn't matter how it feels. It's only matter how it comes. OK, so that was a bit all the through the piece, all the piano. You were gone a bit, so yes? OK, let's try again. And, and please see if Kiki goes pom, 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 down, we go away. Yeah, this. Mm -hmm. Once you do it, you see, the, the, the cantabile is gone. Mm. Because we cannot do all the voice in the same time. Okay. <laughs> Every time you do crescendo, you do diminuendo. And I must tell you, this is one of the most difficult things to do in, in four hands. Because when you shake to a certain direction, usually you also want to go forward. And we are not used to go forward and play diminuendo at the same time. That's very unnatural for almost any piano. So you, you need to learn something new. not to exceed my time <laughs> so <laughs> that you guys have other things to do but it was lovely working with you because it's very new we couldn't run through a lot of things but we had to you know it's all new experiences so it takes time and but thank you for playing the really very 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 good job you know it's really not easy it's a, it's 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 not a piece i would choose as the first piece it's just uh, <laughs> but uh, you know you did very well and and i think now you have a different way of reading the text. And what I would do, every place it doesn't sound, I would, each one of you, learn soprano and voice and bass and understand what is actually that I want, what, how it sounds. And always think, you know, cantabile, phrasing, and so on. Thank you. <laughs>